We're going to talk today about going. That's the theme for the year. Today is simply called Go Connect to a Local Church. How many know the church is God's idea? From the very beginning, it was his idea, not a man's idea. Our church wasn't our idea. That was God's idea as well. When you think of church, what comes to mind? Some people think, well, church is a building. Now, we go to church in a building, but we'd all agree that the church isn't a building. The church is, an in is not an institution, nor is the church an event. The church is a spiritual family. Uh, in the Greek, it's called the ecclesia, the called out ones, those that are called out from the world, and they come together and they form a family. They form a body. So we're talking about today connecting to a church. There's a church globally, but there's also the local church, and that was God's idea from the very beginning. Now, there's a lot of kinds of churches. <laughs> Some people have criticized the church for that. They said, oh, because there's so many churches out there, so many different kinds of variety of churches. Christopher Hitchens, atheist, said he criticized the divisions, claiming that the existence of numerous sects is evidence of the irrationality. So different people have criticized the numerous types of churches, different denominations, but I think that was God's idea in the first place. God is a God of variety, amen? If you haven't noticed, there's a lot of different kinds of birds, 12,000 species around the world, and there are about 45,000 or 34,000 species of fish, and there are about 45,000 different denominations. Yeah, so God's a God of variety. You know God's a God of variety when you go to Baskin Robbins. <laughs> Baskin Robbins has 1,400 flavors of ice cream. They did a survey, Baskin Robbins, and they wanted to figure out what flavor of ice cream makes people the happiest. Any ice cream lovers out here this morning? Okay, there's a few. Most people like ice cream. They did a study when they, Baskin Robbins did this study, they found out that 64% of the people thought that ice cream did actually make them happier, especially if they enjoyed it with other people. They talked to executives, and the executives said that, hey, if we have ice cream, actually we have more camaraderie amongst our team. So when they did this survey, they found out what flavor of ice cream makes people the happiest. Would you like to know what flavor makes people the happiest? Okay, some of you, some of you are guessing. Vanilla, I hear chocolate. Any other favorite? What makes you the happiest? Anybody else? Mint, okay, mint chocolate, all right. Well, let's put it up. This, was, this is off their website. The top 10 ice cream flavors that make people happy. Number one is chocolate. Number two is Jamocha coffee, strawberry, Rocky Road, vanilla's number five, chocolate chip cookie dough. That was a big favorite the last services. Mint chocolate chip, and we also got rainbow sherbet, pralines and cream. So all that to say, God is a God of variety, <laughs> lots of flavors, and there's a lot of flavor of churches. Our church has a certain flavor. It's not everybody's flavor. We get that. The church down the street, I was talking to the minister there one day. I did a little tour, and we were chatting, and, and he said, Dave, I know what kind of church you have. I said, well, what kind of church is it? He said, Dave, you are Baptist with Tabasco sauce. That's what you are. <laughs> so there's your flavor. I guess we're Tabasco flavored church. So that just means you like to spice it up a bit. And, uh, you know, there's different flavors. And that's okay. I think God's cool with that. We're cool with that. I'm glad there's a lot of variety of churches. And we've come to appreciate all the different variety of churches. And we, we focus on the majors and, and not on the minors. And when we get to heaven... I mean, it'll be one big church coming together. And for now, we see a lot of different flavors. So different churches, local churches have different flavors. And God designed it that you would be part of a local church. He designed you as an individual to be connected not only to a physical family, but to a spiritual family. We are designed from the factory, if you like, to be connected, to be connected with God and to be connected with one another, and particularly in a local church. Now, you may not have a physical family, maybe because of circumstances, death, all kinds of circumstances, moving to a new country, but you can always have a spiritual family. If I was to move to Bogota, Colombia, I don't know why I picked Bogota, it just came to mind, but if I moved there, 
I might not know anybody, may not know Spanish, and I don't know Spanish. <laughs> I may not know the language, where to go, but if I can connect to a spiritual family, connect to a local church, I can have community. I can ask somebody, where do I get my driver's license? How do I get health care? All these things for life. I can be connected to community. Would you pray with my needs? We need a local body. We need to be connected to a family. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, we read this. God's purpose, God's purpose, you have a purpose, your computer has a purpose, things have purpose, God has a purpose, what's his purpose? God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety, a lot of variety of church, to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. That was his plan from the very beginning. So before the heavens and the earth, everything was created, God was already thinking about his church. It was an eternal purpose that he would have a family. He'd have a spiritual family. All this was created really around the idea that he'd have a spiritual family. And what is that spiritual family? The church. In Ephesians chapter 5, or chapter 1, verse 5, it says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family. You've been adopted into his family by bringing us himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. That's what brings God pleasure, is when we get adopted into his family. The Bible tells us if one person turns from their sin and comes to Christ, there's a great party in heaven. That's what, that's what brings heaven joy, heaven pleasure. That's what God's pleased with when people connect and they're in his family. We're the healthiest when we're in a physical family, but also when we're in a spiritual family. So that's number one, why we need to connect to a local church is because we're healthy when we're in a family. Number two, if you're following along your notes, the church is Jesus's plan for humanity. God had a plan. Jesus had a plan. His plan was the church. We read in Matthew chapter 16, he said to them, he's talking to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? That's still a good question today. You could ask your friends, you could ask your coworkers, who do you say Jesus is? So he's asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. Now, we all know that Christ is not Jesus' last name. I grew up for a long, as a kid for a long time, I just thought Christ was his last name. Jesus Christ, David Coop, made sense to me. <laughs> but it's not his last name. It's a title. It's the Messiah, the sent one, the Savior. You are the Savior. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, your dad's name, Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, you didn't get this from somebody. You didn't get it from a university. You didn't get it from a school, from somebody else. Who gave this to you? It was revealed to him by the Father who is in heaven. That tells me Peter must have been praying. He was praying, who is Jesus? And God the Father revealed it to him. Jesus goes on to say, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. On the revelation that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, I will build my church. I will build whose church? It's Jesus' church. I will, not maybe, might not happen, might happen. No, I will build my church. 2,000 years later, as we said a couple of weeks ago when we finished the book of Acts, it said the word went on unhindered. And the church has been unhindered. We're still here after thousands of years it's gone on unhindered. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what is his project? What is Jesus working on today? What is the Father thinking about? What was he thinking about before the stars and the moon and the heavens, everything was created? He was thinking about church. He was thinking about his family. The church and his family are the same thing. He knows that we're healthiest and best not only best for us, but best for the country, best for the world when the local church is healthy. So he says, I want you to be connected to a local church. And I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
So if you want to make an investment, people like to invest. Here in Vancouver, we like to invest in real estate. Maybe we like to invest in stocks or bonds or some other kind of investment. And we will always want to return our investment. We spend time thinking about it. We we'll hire financial advisors on where we should invest. Could I be your spiritual advisor this morning and give you some advice on where to invest your time, treasure, and talents invested into his, his project? What's Jesus building? You know, somebody's building a, a high rise across the street or they're building a building. They say, do you want to invest into what I'm building? You'll get a return on your investment. You go, okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll put some money into that. But if I was asked Jesus, Jesus, what are you building? <laughs> you are the son of the living God. I want to invest into what you're doing. He'd say, I, I'm building my church. Invest your time, your treasure, and your talent into what I'm doing. That's an eternal reward. An earthly investment, you'll get an earthly reward. Jesus said, store up treasures in heaven. Well, how do I do that? Invest into his project. His plan is a local church. It's his plan for humanity. Number three, a church family. Yeah, this is so good. A church family moves you out of isolation. A number of years ago, the Vancouver Foundation did a study here in Vancouver the purpose of the study was, what is the biggest social need that we have in our city? They thought it might be drugs, might be poverty, might be homelessness. They were surprised when they did this massive survey, a lot of work went into it. The number one need in the city of Vancouver is isolation and loneliness. That need is also the biggest need in the cities around the world. We know these other things we have in our city, if you went to the root of it, if you could solve the isolation problem, if you could solve the problem of loneliness, of disconnection, the other problems would solve themselves. If you're healthy in a physical family, if you're healthy in a spiritual family, the other problems will begin to melt away. Our big need in our city is loneliness. What happens when you're in a local church, you're no longer lonely. You're no longer isolated. You're connected with other people. That's why we have life group. That's one of the biggest reasons for it, that you're connected to other people. You can have maybe no physical family, but you can always have a spiritual family. Right about here, people will say, well, <laughs> you know what? Human relationships are rich, but they're also messy and demanding. And I've been to church, and I found out that people at church aren't perfect. And uh, if you're looking for a perfect church, I'll just save you some time. This one isn't it. Uh, if, you, if, if you're looking for a church where everybody's angels, uh, do me a favor when you find it. Don't go there because you're going to mess it up. Uh, because <laughs> they're, they're, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And some people just say, I'm not going to church because, it, you know, there's relationship. There's humans there. And you're right. It is messy. But that doesn't stop us from going. We need to be in church. A lot of people have said, I love Jesus. It's a church I have a problem with. Barna Research in the U.S., they found out that many people were say, I'm okay with God, I'm okay with Jesus, but I have de-churched. I no longer attend church. National Post did an article after COVID, and they found that 60.5% of Canadians who said they strongly believe in God never or rarely attend a church service. So I'm okay with Jesus. I'm okay with the Bible. It's the, it's the church that I have a problem with. Folks, that's like saying, I'm okay with the head, but I don't like the body. I like your head, but boy, do I have a problem with your body. <laughs> That'd be a little offensive, right? Another metaphor for the church is that the church is the bride of Christ. So they'd be saying, I'm okay with you today, but boy, I have a problem with your wife. <laughs> We'd say, really? We are the bride of Christ. In the book of Revelation, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, it says the bride is there without spot or wrinkle. The church is his bride, or the church is his body. There's different metaphors. But you cannot separate the Lord Jesus Christ from his church. If you love Jesus... You love the church. If you want to commit yourself to following Jesus and serving Jesus, then you're committed to serving and helping the church, the local church. Thank you for those hearty amens. <laughs> <laughs> to separate Christ from his church would be like telling the body to function without his head. When Jesus died on the cross, we died on the cross. 
When Jesus rose from the dead, we rose from the dead. The two are inseparably linked at the cross and the resurrection. So the church is one with him. One of the greatest benefits of being part of a local church is the fact that you're around people who care and listen. One of my favorite things about being in a life group is being in a group of people that listen. When you're in a life group, you're sitting in a circle. People aren't on their phones. They're not distracted by something else. When you share your highlight of the week, everybody's listening to you. When you share your prayer requests, everybody stops and they just listen to you. Do you know how rare that is today? To sit in a group of people that really care and they're just listening to you. Sherry Turkle, when she did her TED Talk, one of the things she talked about connectedness, she said, my concern is, we have a, we, I'm often asked, she said in her TED Talk, that people would like to have a Siri that not only asks questions, they want a Siri that would just sit and listen to them. See, there's a hunger to be listened to. There's a hunger to be heard. And one of the greatest things we can do in church is listen to one another. Amen. People are screaming to be heard. That's why they, they want to be heard on, a, on an Instagram feed. Or they, that's why you check to see how many comments there were in your Instagram. Who heard me? There's something in us that we, we want to be heard. And the beauty of small groups and life groups is there's people around us that want to hear us and want to pray for us and support us. We, we need one another. We're meant to be connected, not to be alone. The next thing is a church family helps you develop spiritual muscles. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16 says this. As a matter of fact, let's read this one out loud together. There at Squamish online, read this out loud with me if you could. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Look at this last part. The whole body, the idea is that the whole church would be healthy, growing, and full of love. Well, that sounds sweet to me. How does that happen? When every part does its own special work, helps the other parts grow. The whole idea of the church is that we would grow. We're a body. The Bible compares us to a body, and if you're by yourself, you won't grow. If I detach my hand and put it somewhere else, how many know it's not going to be healthy? It's attached to a body. The rest of my body helps it to grow. A church is a place where you can grow spiritually. You can build spiritual muscles. The gym, you build physical muscles. At the church, you can build spiritual muscles. You know, when you get older, the physical muscles don't build as easy. <laughs> And you got, you got age going against you. But it'll never happen with your spiritual muscles. No matter how old you are or how young you are, you can continue to grow stronger spiritually. We're here to help others grow. When you come to Saturday morning prayer, you can learn how to pray with others. You go to life group, others will pray with you. You can learn how to lead. You develop spiritual muscles. If you go to Alpha, you'll learn how to share your faith. So these things, those five doors that we showed you earlier, those are all doors that invite you to come and develop your spiritual muscles, to be stronger spiritually. Yeah. You'll never be your best by yourself. Everybody needs somebody sometime. And the local church... It's a place where you can grow. It's a laboratory, if you like. It's a classroom where you grow stronger spiritually. And over 50 times in the New Testament, the phrase one another or each other is used. And the only time that works is if we are present with somebody else to love each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other, admonish each other, greet each other, serve each other, teach each other, accept each other, honor each other, forgive each other. All these each others happen together. You can't do that when you're out there by yourself. Number six, the body of Christ needs you. Other, you'll grow because of others, but others will grow because of you. You have a special gift. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to who? Each of us. Each of us. So everybody here today, everybody watching online, it's like God was dealing them out. You know, when you deal cards, everybody got dealt in. <laughs> Nobody was missed. Everybody got dealt in. 
Even those that are behind the drum over here, you guys are all dealt in. Everybody was dealt in. Everybody received a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping you become famous. As a means of helping you become popular on Twitter or X or whatever it is or Instagram or Facebook or making more money. No. What does the Bible say? A spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping what? The entire church. My hand has a gift to help the entire body. My eye has a gift to help the entire body. Likewise, you have a gift that'll help the entire church. What's Connect Course for? The Connect Course, we help you figure out what your gift is, your spiritual gift, and how it can be used. You know, if you want to be satisfied in your Christian walk, find out what your gift is and use it. Sometimes it's a bit of trial and error. We moved to Tennessee and we did a year of Bible school there, Cheryl and I, and uh, we didn't have the Connect course. They should have had that. And I, I put up my hand and said, I'll serve. And so they said, okay, we have a place for you. We don't have anybody running the soundboard, so we're going to put you on the soundboard. Now, if you don't know me very well, I have about... My musical talent barely moves the needle, okay? If Ali is a 10, I would be 0.5, okay? I, I, cannot, I, I can't sing on note, on, on, what was it, on key. Yeah, I, my mom put me in piano lessons. Thank you, mom, for doing that. After three years, I got through grade one. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was, I was, to practice piano was pure torture. They had a metrodome. A metro, what's it? Metro what? Is it called metrodome? Metro, gnome. Metronome. Had this thing, went back and forth, tick, 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 tick. And I was, I was practicing piano, like I'm a farm kid, right? I thought, I'd love to put that thing on a fence post and shoot it with the shotgun. That was <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> and just blow it up. My mom doesn't know that. Sorry, mom. That was my thought. Just put it up there. Load the 12-gauge shotgun, give it both barrels, blow it away. <laughs> Never have to tick, 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 keep time, keep time. Every good boy deserves fudge. I do remember that. F-A-C-E, that's about it. So music wasn't my gifting, but they put me in the soundboard. <laughs> I know there's four-part harmony. I, can, I know when it sounds good, but I can't figure out how it works. Anyhow, it's just not my gifting. It's not my natural gift or spiritual gift. They put me back there. And you know what? After the second service, they came back and they said, Dave, I think we have a better place for you to serve. <laughs> you are not helping us. You are hurting us. So <laughs> they put me in a different spot. What we want to do at the Connect course, find, okay, what is your sweet spot? Where, where are your gifts? Where would they make room for you? And let's help you find that spot. And, uh, but the body of Christ needs us. We needs us. We don't need a critic. We, we have enough of those. We don't need cynics. We have enough of those. We, the church doesn't need more critics or cynics. Or even consumers. You can be a critic. You can be a cynic. You can be a consumer. Some people are happy to go to church and be a consumer. I just want to consume. It's about me. Church is made for me. Church is made for Jesus. <laughs> We're there to serve him. It's his church. Not to be a consumer. Some people are like, let somebody else take the responsibility. Let somebody else give. Let somebody else pray. Let somebody else serve. I just want to enjoy the benefits of it. That's the consumer. We live in a world with a consumer mentality. It's driven by that. Don't let that seep into the church. We're here to be a contributor, not a consumer, to be a champion, not a consumer. And the way that happens is we say, hey, I have something to offer. It may be a small role. It could be a big role. But just say, hey, I want to contribute. I want to be a part. I want to champion the local church and what God's doing. Yeah. He has a unique role for every one of us. A lot of people have had... Actually, their gifts were honed, developed, and discovered in a local church. Think of music people today, people in the music industry. A lot of them had to start in a local church. That's where they were believed in, encouraged. I could list the name, a number of them. 
Katy Perry started a church, Justin Timberlake, Carrie Underwood, Britney Spears, Whitney Houston, we could list a whole bunch of people. They got to start a church. Some of them should have stayed in church. <laughs> That's a different message for another time. Which brings me to a point, if I could, is if you have been encouraged and developed, keep giving into the local church. Don't take your talent now and say, well, now I can go become famous with it. Remember that verse, it was for his church that we have special gifts, to help the body of Christ. Great to have a successful career, whether it be in music or finance or whatever it might be. God will encourage you. But never unplug from your local church. Don't unplant yourself. Be planted and rooted in the local church that you can flourish. You might be here this morning and you'd say, well, how do I know what my gifts are? How do I know what my spiritual gifts are? Here's a couple questions you might want to ask yourself. What doors open for me? What am I doing when I lose track of time? What comes naturally to me? What do people most value about me? Where do I focus my energy and actions? Whom do I have a heart for? Who would I like to mentor me? What problems trouble me the most? You know, what troubles you or makes you cry is a good indication where your gifts are. John Maxwell said, if you answer this question, I'll know a lot about you. What makes you cry? What makes you laugh? And what do you dream about? If you're dating somebody and you're wondering if they're the right person, you might want to ask that question to them. You'd learn a lot just from asking that question. So you too, you have a special gift that's needed in the body of Christ. And if it's not there, if my hand wasn't here, my whole body would suffer. You know what it's like if you've broken an arm or you've had an injured part of your body. Your whole body suffers because of it. And some of you have gifts and talents and we can't do all we could do because your gift isn't being used. So I encourage you and challenge you. Say, hey, where can I serve? A lot of times it's progressive. You know, you, I didn't start by being a pastor, but my gift evolved as I went along. And today, this is where I serve, but that's my spiritual gifting, and it's not any better than anybody else's. We are an orchestra. We're a body that all comes together, and the head is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, we've been adopted into this family. I'm not finishing up my message. I'll finish it next week. We have more to say, but time is up, and so we'll talk next week about the last point. I want to give you an opportunity this morning. Maybe you're here and you're watching. You say, I... I believe in Jesus, but I've never received him. Here's what John said. He said, to as many as believed and received him, they became the children of God. So, because I have a, I think in math terms, believe plus receive equals child of God. Let me say that again. Believe plus receive equals child of God. Believe by itself does not equal child of God. It's believe plus receive. Just as I showed you those five doors, there's a door to come into the family of God. You can say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died and rose again. I believe there is a God. I believe he loved us so much that he sent his Son. That's great. The next step is, I receive that. Because he will never force his way into your life. The only way he comes into your life, and the only way he can adopt you into the family, is if you say, I receive what God did for me by sending his son. Some of you have never received. You believe, but you've never received. Come into that family. Be part of a local church. It could be this one. It could be another local church. But be part. Be plugged in. Be faithful. There's no perfect church. You're going to go through ups and downs, and you're going to find there's wrinkles in it. But stay. Be faithful. Pray into it. Be part of a local church. First step is to be part of his family. So would you pray with me this morning? Maybe you've never prayed and ask him to come in your life. Let him adopt you. Let him welcome you into the family. Would you pray with me this morning? Follow along online at Squamish here this morning. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I believe and I receive what you did for me, Heavenly Father, when you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to be raised from the dead, 
so I could have eternal life. I receive that today. Thank you, God, for adopting me into your spiritual family. Amen.